Every night we light the candle It stands beside our bed And sometimes the flame's too much to handle That's what you said That's what you said You should know Because you built a fire in me and you made it burn You followed me watching every move Matching every turn Your green eyes, they don't miss a thing They hold me like the sun going down Like a fire in the night Without a sound mm -hmm. and You were waiting till I heard Just as patient as that love light in your eyes Never threw away a word Or ever talked In a disguise I ought to know You were a beacon to a sailor lost at sea I saw it in your eyes when you looked at me So open They don't miss a thing They hold me like the sun going down Warm me like a fire in the night Without a sound The, the, the Bowen house was right here and where that curve is in the road, Mr. Bowen had a store. This was a little community called Coon Hollow. There was four stores there. There was a saddle shop, uh, a drug store, and Bowen's general merchandise store. And then they had one other store. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but there was four stores there. Bowen's. And John yeah. Wesley Horton came in here in February of 1871 and lived on where our ranch is now. His, his, his uncle had a place there. His uncle's name was Clements. And he had four sons, Gip, John, Joe, and, and Manny. And they were just as big outlaws John Wesley Horton. He, they were all gun toters. This was all open range. And there was two factions that uh, were competing for cattle. There was a faction of tailors, and there was just another faction led by a guy named Tomlinson. But anyway, yeah. he was he was the group that was opposed to this group, and they were they were killing each other and hanging each other. And Harden fell in with the Taylor group, and that was this group. And Brown Bowen turned out to be his brother-in-law. He lived when he came in '71. He lived up here with his the Clements family that lived on our ranch, and. brush covered the country you could sit on that hill and see this old Bowen house right here so it wasn't a far reach for him to meet Jane it was just right down the road or right down the hill anyway they married and married in Gillette and Brown Bowen became his brother-in-law but Brown had married a girl 
three years earlier, he married her in, in Rancho. And, they, and Jonathan Scott was the presiding justice that, that did the man of marriage. Now, where, where was the house? I'll show it to you, but it was just right down off this hill in a little old... Uh, in fact, it stood until about five years ago when a tornado hit it and just <laughs> demolished it. Okay. Okay, folks, we are here at the grave of Joshua Robert Brown Bowen. And when I say we, that is Don Hoffman of Nixon, Kurt House of San Antonio. All right, we are here to visit the grave again. 1878, Brown Bowen was hung for the murder of Thomas Haldeman. There is considerable controversy over that because Brown Bowen, as he stood on the gallows in downtown Gonzales, just a few miles from here, he claimed that John Wesley Hardin was the man that killed Haldeman. And of course, John Wesley Hardin, who had already killed a number of people, denied killing Haldeman, stating he would never kill a man the way that Brown Bowen killed Haldeman. It happened because Bowen, Hardin, some of the Clements boys, and some others were celebrating something, drinking and carousing at the Billings store in Nopal. And Bowen, or Hardin, depending on who you believe the most, believed that Haldeman was a spy for old Joe Tomlinson which was a man on the Sutton side of the feud. And for that reason, whoever killed Haldeman killed him. Now, whether it was Bowen or Hardin, we can't say. The jury believed that it was Bowen who was guilty of the murder based on the text testimony of, I think, a 11, 13-year-old boy, young Mac Billings. Billings may have believed what he testified, but he also may have been afraid of what John Wesley Hardin would do if he claimed that Hardin was the killer. So there you are. The jury believed Billings. Hardin denied it. We don't know. Um, what's interesting is that Hardin later claimed that the killing of Haldeman, quote, was equal to our Kansas trip. And he's referring to the cattle drive in 1871 when Hardin, the Clements boys, and others drove cattle up to Abilene and during that trip up to Abilene, the Shadden brothers were shot and killed, supposedly while they slept. That again is controversial. But there are many things in the history of just this area, this Gonzales County area, that is so controversial. It depends on who you believe is the bottom line. And Don Hoffman, maybe you want to add something to that, or Kurt? Well, this whole country was divided up in two groups. It was open range country, and the feud developed over ownership of cattle. Uh, the, the group of cattlemen in Rancho claimed all the cattle within their area where they were branded unbranded. Any outsider was not welcome and would be hanged or shot. The people at Helena under Tomlinson, known as the regulators, had the same attitude towards their area. So it started out a range war, grew into a vendetta uh, between the two groups. And there was a lot of killing for just no reason at all other than just to kill. And there was a saying that you had that uh, you had to take sides, one or the other, and if you did, it was just as dangerous not to because then both sides were after you. 
So this whole country was just teeming with a civil war that still hadn't ended. And it was between the old mainstay ranchers and the new regulators that were doing the bidding of the Yankee occupation troops and received favorable treatment with the law and ownership division of cattle. So the regulators were Northern troops supported, the old guard was the tailors and were supported by no one but themselves. So it's easy to understand how you get two stories in every story, two sides. I just want to thank Chuck for his foresighted uh, view way back there, Chuck. Didn't you visit this site 1988 or something like Earlier that? Earlier than that, I think it was 1977 when I first visited this very spot. Fortunately, I had visited with Genevieve Valentine, who was the head of the Historical Commission of Gonzales County. She referred me to Norman Barnett. Norman Barnett and I came up here and there were the broken original headstone of Brown Bowen. We gathered up the broken pieces and they are now in the Gonzales Old Jail Museum for forever, I hope. And Norman Barnett told me that down the hill there was a well that has been dug, originally dug by Hardin and his relative Frank Barnett. So there again, I've also read that it was dug by Brown Bowen and Hardin. Brown Bowen and Hardin by now were brothers-in-law because John Wesley had married the little sister of Brown, Jane. There you go. If you want controversy, just come to Gonzales. <laughs> Chuck, let's tell them about this particular tombstone being reconstructed and since the old one was crumbly and y'all saved that and then when did this one get placed here? I think, uh, I believe in the 1988 maybe, um, it was built or installed by probably the Solansky Monument Works of Gonzales by I've forgotten the lady's Nelda name. Nelda Patterson. Nelda Patterson, yes. You remember everything. <laughs> That's why we need you. <laughs> Nelda Patterson. Uh, I don't know the details, but she was involved in installing the, the slightly incorrect headstone for Brown Bowen, but at least it was uh, something to remember him by. And Soon, we hope that there will be historical markers in the area so tourists and the local people can both come drive down that road and see a historical marker that says up on that hill is the grave of Brown Bowen. And interestingly, there's probably several other members of the Bowen family buried here and never had a stone. One thing we'd also like to point out, you know, history is an ongoing journey, so we've learned a lot since 1988. And one thing is the uh, error on the tombstone, his middle initial is O on the tombstone, and that's not correct, right, Chuck? Correct. His it real name wanted Josiah Robert? Yes. So... The O was in Josiah, and they misread that and that's the cause of the error and it may not ever get corrected but such is history. So here we are in 2022 uh, kind of reviewing all this information. We've learned some things since 1988 and we hope it continues. Uh, somebody picks up the banner and carries it on from here is the Wild West History Association. Donald's doing it. Tell about the 22 markers you're putting up on the well, Wild we, West we, 
I guess Hardin probably is the most infamous gunfighter ever. Yep. Uh, the deadliest for sure. Uh, supposedly he killed 42 men during his lifetime and uh, he himself was killed in El Paso in uh, 90, 1896. But prior to, that, prior to that time, his cousins lived on a hill about a half a mile from here on my family's ranch. And the proximity to that home, to Bowen's home, gave them reason to visit as a family and get acquainted with Jane and Hardin later on married her and went to Gillette, strangely enough, to get his, to, to be married. And his brother-in-law, Brown Bowen, had been married in Rancho by Jonathan Scott, who was the justice peace there then. So why one part of the family would get married in Rancho and other than Gillette, I really don't know. But this was kind of a little, I guess you'd say a hub of a lot of things. There was a road to Gonzales, a road to Helena, a road to Rancho, a road to Cuero, or to Clinton at the time. So this was kind of a crossroads right here. And it was, I guess you would say, an area that was teeming with competition for unbranded cattle, which led to a range war, which led to a feud, which led to a vendetta, and most of the history of this area is reported to be a very violent time, and which is probably the most interest to people. You know, we don't talk about peacetime much. We talk about all the feuds and the fighting and the killings, but that was, this was like what this area was famous for. And another little known fact is that uh, the origin of ranching in North America really started with the missions in uh, San Antonio and down the San Antonio River, which came through this country. And so really, this country down here and southward uh, is the birthplace of the whole cattle industry and ranching in North America, don't you think, Doc? Yes, well, an interesting thing I might note is that the largest ranch in Colonial Texas encompassed this area here. It was all the land between the Guadalupe River and the San Antonio River from the Cibolo Creek all the way to the coast. It had about two million acres and it was headquartered in Goliad. It's called the Spitter de Santo Ranch. And these outlying areas, these little towns, grew up after the Spanish were run out of Mexico and Mexico ceded the land back to empresarios that came in. And this land was then parceled out to the new landowners in what they call league grants. Uh, and this area here was, was um, I guess you would say, part of the uh, um, Dewitt colony. And those, there was four major colonies in that, this area. It was the Dewitt colony, the uh, Irish colonies down the coast, which was the O'Connors. McMullen, uh, McGloin. McGloin and the Powers. And McGloin. then there was the San Antonio River ranch area with all the old Spanish ranches. So but, this, you can't go back any further in Texas history than this. This is where it started. We're talking 1730s, 1740s, as far back as that, right after the missions got started, because the Rancho de las Cabras is right over here in Wilson County. And this is sort of like Don said, the hub of Carnes, Wilson, Gonzales, DeWitt County. And we think uh, the prevailing new opinion is that in this county southward, uh, Wilson, Carnes, my county, Live Oak, where I'm from, B, all the way down there, is where ranching really got started. And they had thousands and thousands of a head of cattle, horses, sheep, goats. If you read the Spanish records, it's just mind-boggling. It was ranching on a large scale. Yeah, if I could add one thing to it, a lot of people wonder where the cattle came from. When the Spanish heard that the French were making an, in, in, uh, an intrusion into Texas, they sent an explorer to try to find the French. The guy's name was Alfonso de Leon, and he came in in 1689. 
his mission was to find the French, but to also provide a food store for future colonists that may come in. So he brought with him a small herd of cattle and a herd of horses. And every river he would come to as an explorer, he would leave some horses and some cattle to grow and be the food source for future explorer or future settlers that would come in a later time. He named the Atascosa, he named the San Antonio River, the Guadalupe, and the Oasis. the Oasis all the way through as he went. And those wild cattle multiplied to be several million cattle by the time Texas had kicked out the Mexicans in the revolution. And all of a sudden, all these wild range cattle, unbranded, were free for the taking. And the first settlers in here came in here to be farmers, but quickly traded their plows for a horse and a lariat so they could begin to build our cattle herds. So this was really the, the beginning of the Texas cattle industry. Victoria, for example, claims to be the cradle of the cattle industry. So this really is, if you study a Spanish history of Texas and Mexican, like Don said, this is where ranching all started, right down here. We have had a history and geography lessons right here at the gravesite of Brown Bowen. And interestingly enough, when we speak of thousands of heads of cattle, thousands of horses, sheep, goats, and so on, that reminded me of a newspaper article in maybe the Gonzales Inquirer, maybe the Galveston Daily News, of a rancher who came to this area with one cow and within six months, he had 500 head of livestock. And the paper commented that was a remarkable example of animal husbandry. How one cow, who was probably eight or 10 years old, could multiply so fast. And I'm not sure if we should believe everything we read in the newspapers of 1870, Certainly not today, but that's another story. And the way I heard it, Kirk, Chuck, he started out with a steer. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> even better. <laughs> Increased to hundreds of cattle. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Every night we light the candle that stands beside our bed. And sometimes the flame's too much to handle. That's what you said. That's what you said. You should know. Because you built a fire in me and you made it burn You followed me watching every move Matching every turn Your green eyes, they don't miss a thing They hold me like the sun going down Fire in the night without a sound. 